This episode of Trek Geeks is brought to you by Fansets, the place for amazing pin collectibles. They have over 150 officially licensed Star Trek pins to choose from with new pins coming out every month. See all the pins and collectibles they have to offer at fansets.com and stay tuned for this week's special Trek Geeks discount code. Fansets, we are Star Trek. This week's episode of Trek Geeks is also brought to you by Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Starships collection. You can bring home the Enterprise D from Star Trek The Next Generation for only $4.95 when you sign up today at st-starships.com slash trekgeeks. Hi, this is Nana Visitor, Major Kira Norris from Deep Space Nine, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Gamma Quadrant, the Trek Geeks podcast. With Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. Once again, we're back at the adjudication office at Podfleet Command here on the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant, your independent Star Trek podcast. Greetings, one and all. Welcome to Trek Geeks. I am your co-host, Bill Smith. I always get excited for these particular episodes because it's always a fun discussion and it's always a fan favorite type of thing that we get to do. And of course, when I say we, I do have to bring in my co-host i know it's the holidays and you're supposed to be nice to people but he's dan davidson and he's here so hey what's up what's up jerky hey i mean hey welcome buddy yeah thanks it's great to be here i'm such a liar but um no it, it is good to be here and like you said bill these are the ones that we really look forward to uh uh to doing it's time for coc it is i like that you like that i like coc i'm gonna call it that from now on and if, you may want to call it what it is for the people at home <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it is see it or skip it. And here we are on the final season of our favorite Star Trek series, Deep Space Nine. It's unbelievable. The 25th anniversary celebration is wrapping up uh, in just a couple of weeks. It'll be the end of 2018. It's been an amazing anniversary celebration. And uh, we're going to wrap it up with a couple of great episodes here with season seven, see it or skip it. And then, of course, next week we're going to be tackling uh, what you leave behind. Of course, we'll get to that next week. But it's fantastic to be here, man. And we have an amazing, amazing person joining us once again on Trek Geeks, don't we? Uh, We do. In fact, for the full hour, Mm. as Larry King would say, we have the lovely and talented Mr. Norman Lau. Uh, you've heard him here on Trek Geeks. You've heard him all over the podcastification on the planet. And he is a dear friend of ours. And we couldn't think of anybody better to uh, to shepherd us through this final season of Deep Space Nine. Norm, welcome back, my brother. Oh, thank you. And, and praise be to the Pa Wraiths for allowing me to come here on this show. <laughs> no, no, no. Not the no. Prophets, people. They lied no. to me. They lied to me. They betrayed me. They betrayed our people. The power rates is where it's at. That's where the true power lies. Oh, my God. I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> Love the power rates. Love them. Thank, no, thanks, guys, for having me back on. Uh, you know, we, was, uh, we were talking uh, earlier, and I was on episode 100. So, um, listeners, for n- another 63 episodes, you'll hear me back again. That's think, fantastic. Right? I, yeah, yeah, they can time warp or, or they can go from 100 straight to 163 and, and all will be right with the world because they'll have more Norman Lau in their lives. Oh, that's and who doesn't thing. want that? <laughs> oh, okay. I know I do. I do. Okay, so the checks in the mail. <laughs> so, so, Norm, tell us about your brand new venture because I think that there are a lot of people out there who would love to hear about it. Oh, thanks for asking. Yes. So currently i am wrapping up my tenure with the fandom podcast network i am the co-host of several of their shows blood of kings the highlander podcast with kevin reitzel also discoville the discovery and orville podcast also with kevin and then i host a variety of other shows as a co-hosting guest 
But I'll be wrapping that up soon. And I have started a new program on a new network called the Zcast Network. And the show was called Zocalocast. Now, the, the fun thing about this format is that Charlene Schmidt of the Nerd Party Network and I are doing it live on our Facebook group, Zocalocast. So there's no net. There's no editing. There's pretty much the one take. And it's a great, interesting dynamic because you are chatting with the fans in real time. They're typing in their responses in the discussion group. And believe it or not, I was recording last night. It was a thrill to have John Iacovelli, the production director and designer from Babylon 5, on that show listening to us and giving us feedback. I was nervous as Julian asking Jadzia for her first date. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Esri. Where am I? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Kick oh. me off. I can. He, he asked them both. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. He's a creeper. Okay. That's a. That is amazing, and that is. I mean, the reason why B5 looks the way it does is because of him. I mean, right. It's uh, that's all his influence, all his work, and man, he's just a. Uh, he is great at what he does, and that's so amazing. Congratulations. That's a. That's awesome. Thank you. Essentially, he was their verse, their Herman Zimmerman in a way, you know, because he set kind of like the visual key for Babylon 5, the sets, uh, the production elements and all of the, you know, all of the ongoings that happened. Like Herman Zimmerman was responsible for. I mean, aside from like Michael Kuda and the Dees and, and Doug Drexler, you know, Herman sure. was really much the driving force. So, yeah, I was I was nervous. I was like, OK, sure, let's do this. And then all of a sudden job popped on. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Great maker. I better have another drink. So you know, it, it's a lot of fun and it's just great to talk to fans like you know you do and talk about what we love most. And it's really inspiring and it adds a little bit of joy in our lives. That's the best part, man. Well, we are we are joyful that you are here with us. And Dan, everyone else is going to be joyful to hear Norman's golden tones. How might they tell us about their their joyfulness? Um, so that we can relay those messages. Great joy. It is great joy. And it is so easy to get in touch with us. Just head right on over to trekgeeks.com slash contact. And there you can find a variety of ways to get in touch with either Bill or myself. You can leave us a voicemail. You can Skype chat us. Uh, You can fill out the contact form and type us out a personalized message, or you can click on that big blue button on the right-hand side of the website and leave us a message with your very own mellifluous voice using SpeakPipe. And hey, don't forget the place to be is on Facebook these days. It's the official Facebook group, Camp Kittimer. Bring your Trek talk, your Trek picks, and your Trek love over to that site and join almost 1,300 other Star Trek friends to talk all things Trek. And hey, don't forget every Friday, it's the Friday Commute Celebration where Bill and I will do our weekly lip sync, especially for our campers. And as a special treat, it's all holiday-themed songs for the entire month of December. It is going to be a blast. To join the group, just head on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer and be ready to take part in all the fun. And as always, we do want to thank our wonderful admins, Heather, Jackie, and Dan, for the amazing work they do running the camp. And also, uh, please remember that any comments or messages you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode. That's right. I double-dipped. <laughs> that and you you went so seamlessly i i am nothing but impressed well done sir I i'm a little terrified that, myself <laughs> yeah <laughs> dan we want to take a moment to wish everyone at fansets a wonderful holiday and a happy new year you know we are just so proud to be working with this remarkable group of people and we truly cannot wait to see the awesome products they're going to be releasing in 2019 Oh, absolutely, Bill. You know, we love everyone at Fansets so much. And you know, one of the things I love most about them, Bill, uh, that's that they do things the right way. For instance, we have a special announcement for anyone who has purchased the new Captain Pike from Discovery's Season 2 pin. Well, the guys at Fansets didn't like the way the good captain's hair came out on the pin. So we have, if you have purchased one of these, Send an email to customer.service at fansets.com with your name and your shipping address and advise them that you purchased this Discovery's Captain Pike. Then they're going to send you an updated Captain Pike pin at absolutely no cost to you. And on top of that, Bill, whoever does this gets to keep the original Captain Pike pin. You know, that's what customer service is all about, man. You know, it it truly is top-notch service. And in addition to their great service, Dan, they're having a great 
end of the year, beginning of the year sale, two sales in one. You know, so to take advantage of this special event before pin prices go up in January, folks, from December 25th to January 3rd, enter the code word year end. That's all caps, no spaces, year end at checkout for 20% off your entire order. Everything. <laughs> Wait, everything means everything, including things like the Captain Kirk autograph pin wow. uh, with William Shatner's hand signed autograph, as well as other genres. And of course, Dan, all the accessories. Now, this code is going to be available until midnight on Thursday, January 3rd. So head on over to fansets.com today. That is amazing. Fansets is pinpoint accuracy. And we thank our friends at Fansets for sponsoring this week's episode. gentlemen we convene once again to decide which episodes are going to make the cut in the fan favorite see it or skip it it's hard to believe that this is the last season of deep space nine that we're running through the uh, the gauntlet of sorts dan but um it's uh, this year has gone by super quick it's gone by very quick there's been so many great moments in deep space nine reflection on this 25th anniversary and one of the things that you and i have loved doing all year long is these see it or skip it episodes because it gives us a chance to to re-watch and um really reconnect uh with the series um i watch deep space nine all the time but i just watch episodes i'll just scan through and pick something but with these you like to watch the entire season in order and it, it really brings brings back great memories of just how amazing the show was. So um, it's a little sad that we're doing the last one here tonight, but at the same time, it's a great celebration of, of my all time favorite Star Trek show. I have to agree with you hundred percent. I've done a, almost a complete rewatch of deep space nine this year. And you know, there are things you forget about until you go back and rewatch no matter how many times you've seen the show. And by the time I got to the end of season seven, it was just, there was waterworks. You know, I, I appreciate the show so much more now that I can watch it. I can binge it uh, because I think it changes the viewing experience. Now, Norm, you did a huge rewatch of season seven for this very event. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming you concur with that assessment, Mon Frere. Oh, absolutely. I think that because it's the uh, the serialized format where you can watch episode to episode and then there are, there are cliffhangers and then there are two-parters and three-parters, I think that being able to binge watch it, you actually feel the full impact of exactly what what they wanted to tell you. Whether you know, I'm sure it's uh, Iron St Stephen Bear was probably the, the thrust of a lot of that type of format. I don't know Deep Space Nine as well as you guys do, but watching this in in totality in the uh, compressed amount of time, uh, watching what 26 episodes in the span of a couple of days, I felt like I appreciated the story more and could feel where they needed to do and make a couple of uh, key decisions. Now, to be honest with you, I felt like I know that I'm coming to the end. So yeah. there are there are obviously storylines and threads that are trying to tie up certain things and make things a little bit more definite as in terms of endings. So I know why that there are certain decisions that were made in storytelling. But overall, though, I, I love episodic TV, but this was really a, a pleasant, pleasant rewatch in total. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I um, I, I liked season seven even more uh, this time around, knowing. I mean, I know how it ends, right? Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, Dan, um, it's the last season. So, in case nobody told you, there's no more Deep Space Nine. I know, I know. But isn't um, there though? <laughs> oh, well, that's right. Because nice the theoretical plot. season eight discussion is coming up in what we left behind the deep space nine documentary. Nice Norman Lau. That's why you're a top tier podcaster and we make your face jokes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's level set everybody on how this works. So Norm, you're in charge of the chaos. You get to shepherd us through the season and decide who gets to read what, um, uh, as far as, you know, who goes first for their ratings or see it or skip it. And then of course you get to chime in. Once uh, you've given your judgment, yay or nay, I'll uh, let people know how Camp Kittimer voted because we have those results thanks to Debbie Moltisanti, who comes through for us big time every time we do a Theater Skip It episode. And um, with that, I leave the podcast in your ever-so-capable hands again, Norm. 
Nice. Oh gosh, we're doomed, just like the Defiant. <laughs> okay, so. oh, totally. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Did your arm oh. ache? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's start. I mean, since you have me on here, I might as well be really selfish and go first. Is that okay? Oh, you can do whatever you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, do whatever I want. It's my show. Well, thank you everyone for joining Trek Geeks. I'm your host, Norman Lau. And with me are co-hosts and special guests, Dan Davidson and the other guy, because I like Dan so much. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank it's just you. like episode 100 all over again. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's start with episode one, Image in the Sand. And then I read the synopsis, yes? Oh, yes. Please. Okay. With the Bajoran wormhole collapsed, Cisco struggles for a way to contact the Bajoran prophets. The Romulans receive permission from the Bajorans to open a military hospital on the moon Dorma. General Martok offers Worf an opportunity to gain admission to Stovokor for Jadzia. That's well done. Right that was there. beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, so, okay, so what did so you think about it? it? Well, I did watch the end of season six because I know it was a cliffhanger. I know what happened to Jadzia and I know what the, the, you know, the dynamic was between uh, her and uh, Goldicott in the temple. Yeah. So knowing that, I know that Image in the Sand has to be told because it has to continue what happened to Jadzia. Also, it, it felt like uh, it felt like there was something that needed to be, uh, I guess, transferred when it comes to um, what are you going to do with Cisco now, the emissary, once the you know the the prophets have been disconnected from him. Right. Uh, I I really liked Worf's kind of um, his his desire to get Jadzia's spirit to Stovacor. But I also felt that the whole thing with the Cisco and the sand dream and being in the thing, it was just a little disjointed for me, but I understand why they had to do that because they have to give them a mission to be able to find how, how, how much spoiler am I allowed to get in, in my, uh, it's, it's, it's been out for 25 years or 20 okay, years. So, ago. Um, so I felt like there was a little bit of, um, uh, I, I guess, a. Uh, contrivance with having his mom, his real biological mom being there and making that genetic connection to him being the emissary. So yep. I, I just felt like, okay, I, I understand why you have to do that, but just watching it as a season seven episode isolated, it felt a little forced, but overall though, I really liked the episode. So that sounds like a see it for you then. Oh yeah. See it. Absolutely. You have to see it because you have to see what happens after Jadzia dies. Nice. So yeah. which one of us now gets to go first? Uh, let's see, Dan, because I threw the defiant thing at him. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Well, great to have you on. Uh, no, you, know, this is, uh, you know, it's a see it. I mean, I'm not sure that there would be anybody who wouldn't say that this is a see it. Deep Space Nine has made a habit of having amazing openers for a season and this final season is no different i will say kind of along the lines of what you said norm it was a little too convenient to have a hidden orb buried under the sand on the planet that was named after captain's kirk kirk after kirk's old friend in a private little war but um still there's too much to love about this episode to really give it any uh negative comments it is a definite see it and a great way for the final season to kick off bill I, I agree with you. It's a definite see. And I mean, you have to. There is so much uncertainty at the beginning of this episode that it doesn't seem like a season premiere. You know, and I think that's really what makes this so great. You know, plus, I mean, there is a lot that occurs just in this 48 minutes. You know, it sets the tone for the remainder of the final season. And uh, it, it's hard to believe that this is where it all starts. So I think it's a great start to the final season. For me, it's a definite see it. Um, Camp Kittimer tends to agree. Uh, 100% of respondents said that they would see Image in the Sand, Norm. Oh, I think it's uh, it's definitely a see it. If for any other reason, it has to continue the lore and the storyline from the cliffhanger ending from season six. I mean, that's that's I think it's a given. I mean, regardless that that the episode was fantastic, it's just the continuation of a story. I mean, really, yeah. I think the first three episodes are one in my opinion sure yeah no i i agree with you it's a nice mini trilogy to start the uh the last season mm -hmm. so dan let's go with you next for episode two. Oh, well, i want to hear what the description is buddy oh do i have to read the description and then oh yeah yeah you're, you're, oh, i'm leading this the whole oh, yeah, you're, you're the lead, man buddy. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear Bill's pedantic drivel. I'll I'll show. I want to hear you, oh, brother. God, the pressure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, you get to, to to tell us the episode and then give us the uh, the plot description and then you oh. uh, 
you toss it back and forth to each of us and and we usually give our our vote so i'm such an I'm so epic fail i'm sorry nah you're doing great ah, you okay, so episode, episode so two <laughs> shadows and symbols a new dax appears on the scene cisco's quest leads him to the truth about his existence now to be completely honest about my review on this i felt like it was a continuation of image in the sand it was just an ex extending the introduction of Ezri Dax from the cliffhanger ending, extending the the search for Sarah, you know, in the desert, finding that orb, extending the storyline. So it, it, in many ways, it felt like it could have been maybe 30 minutes of a condensed story that was tacked on to the first episode for like an hour, 30 minute movie. But then again, we have episode three. So anyway, I think because it's still so connected with the first episode, I think it's a see it, in my opinion. Bill, like that. Well, thanks, Norm. I'm going to agree with you. Um, as like you said, this is a mini trilogy. And, and even if you examine this episode on its own merits, I think you have to see this to meet the next Dax and to get the sense that she's just absolutely not Jadzia. Plus, I think it's a great introduction for her. I mean, we start to learn that that she is different. And as the season progresses, we learn how different. But I like the way she's introduced in this episode um, and, uh, that's just, it's a see it for me, Dan. Yes, it, it is a see it for me as well, but I want to say this. I loved Jadzia Dax. I love Terry Farrell. I love Jadzia, love Jadzia, love Jadzia. So I was a little skeptical about this tiny new little Dax showing up, uh, at Ben's door at the end of the last episode. But although I don't, love Ezri as much as Jadzia, because I love Jadzia, in case you didn't understand that. Um, Ezri is an awesome character. It's great that you see that she is completely different from Jadzia, but also has the Dax symbiont. So there's a lot that she's a lot of familiarity with her. And I think it this was a great initial story about her. So it is a definite see it. Absolutely. Nice. Wow. Camp Kittimer is uh, not as high on this episode, but it's still right up there. I mean, we're looking at a 96% on, as a see it on this one. Uh, some of the verbatims, um, if you pass over the wharf scenes, see it. <laughs> uh, Ezri and Emissary plot good. Klingon plot boring, see it. Uh, I'm sensing a trend here. Uh, mm. I almost wish they had just not reintroduced Dax. See it. I think that's an oh, interesting comment. Interesting. And then lastly... Um, best uniforms in Starfleet, the desert robes. See it. <laughs> <laughs> Which we kind of see a little bit later in Discovery, if you think about it. Yeah. We do. Yeah, we yeah. do. And their interpretation of the desert robes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alrighty then. Yeah, I guess that takes us to episode three. Episode three, after image. Everyone who knew Jadzia Dask react. Jeez, retake that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Everyone who knew Jadzia Dax reacts strongly to Ezri Dax's presence, particularly Worf. Meanwhile, Garrick suffers from bad attacks of claustrophobia. Now, I found this episode really interesting because this is where we got to see a little bit more of the Ezri personality and how she was using her, her education and her skill set as a counselor with probably one of the, if not the most mental manipulating skill sets on the station and that's Garrick. So I, I thought that was really interesting. I love seeing Andrew Robinson as Garrick. Oh God. Yeah. You know, absolutely. In total. Uh, he's actually, he's my favorite character on deep space nine, but uh, I, I like this episode. I would say see it if for the fact that it wraps up this trilogy of image in the sand shadows and symbols, and then now after image, but I also like seeing Nicole, just kind of like flex and try and understand who her character is. And then everyone's reactions to her. Um, Worf seems to come off a little too wounded, but maybe that's just the way people needed to react to him because it was, it's, it's high drama, especially yeah. with Klingons. So no. <laughs> what do you think, Dan? Yeah. Yeah, um, it is a see it for me, and I'm going to say it a little bit more bluntly than you did in just a second. But uh, I thought this was a good Esri development story. Um, 
to be blunt, Worf's kind of a dick in this episode. Um, but I've said that before in different episodes with Worf. So he's just being Worf, I guess. Um, I did find it very interesting that Esri got a promotion as soon as she transferred to Deep Space Nine as a counselor. So, Norm, I'm going to ask to transfer to your podcast so I can get a promotion to executive co-producing president, vice president. Does that work for you? As long as Good, I can stay thanks. wounded. <laughs> 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 Bill, what do you think, buddy? <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's another see it. You know, I think that uh, you have to round out this little trilogy. It's a great introduction of Esri on the station. And I think there are so many great beats here for so many characters. Um, there's a lot to digest in this episode. And I think it's worth it, if not for the acting and the character development alone. Plus, I mean, Andy Robinson as Garrick uh, doing just as as good a job as counseling people as Esri is supposed to be able to do. So it's a definite see it for me. Uh, Camp Kittimer agrees to the tune of 88%. Uh, some of the verbatims there. Uh, curious to see how many people say skip here. I <laughs> see it. Hmm. Garrick is such a great character to pair Ez- Esri with this early in her tenure. Uh, bonk, bonk on the airlock. See it. Bonk, uh, bonk. <laughs> <laughs> the Garrick scenes are must see. See it. Um, the wire again, acceptable Garrick levels. See it. Um, uh, oh, there's one. I absolutely detest the character of Ezri Dax. Skip it. Wow. Yes. I, I, I got to imagine there's going to be a few more of those, uh, for some of the Ezri episodes this season, but, uh, 80% still a very strong number. Yeah. If I may, um, steal a minute here, I can understand the, you know, the, uh, the fans issue with Ezri, because as a Babylon five fan, it was the same kind of response that Captain Elizabeth Lockley had when Susan Ivanova left. And there are, you had six seasons with Jadzia, six seasons with Terry, six seasons with pouring your heart and soul and connecting with a character that you fell in love with and loved and loved and loved like Dan kind of did. But, you know, (laughs) and then all of a sudden you have somebody new. And I think that the fan reaction is exactly the reaction that you can extrapolate from the characters on the station i mean they're they're dealing with somebody new they're not sure if they're supposed to like her and in that sense that distrust or that instability instability is what the fans are feeling so i find that you can project really well with what the characters are doing on the station and connect that way as a fan that's how i felt wow yeah i buy that like it yep absolutely all righty then so let's go to episode four take me out to the hollow suite Cisco must train his staff to play baseball when the Vulcan captain Solok, an old rival of his, challenges Cisco to a game while his ship is being repaired. I found this to be incredibly interesting, this episode, primarily because that Vulcan can hold a grudge, boy. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so... I know why an episode like this has to happen because there's so much heaviness that's going on between the, the continuation of six to seven and then seven's episode one, two, and three. So take me out to the hollow suite is a nice way just to get everyone to participate in a very light episode. But in terms of how I feel about it as a, a continuation of the lore and the thrust of deep space nine season seven, I find that I can skip this episode without really losing a lot of content getting to the next episode. So I'm going to say skip it. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Hang up on him. (laughs) (laughs) Bye, guys. Interesting. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Who's next? Uh, Let's see. Well, let's see. You wanted to hang up on me, Dan, so why don't you go ahead? (laughs) I will will go ahead. Okay, Bill, go ahead. How's that? You wanted to hang up on me, too? All right. No, he wanted to hang up on you. He can wait. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Hold, please. Click. Yeah. Why don't Click. you hang out with Solok with your, with your pride and your Vulcan not being Vulcan? Yeah, Dan. <laughs> Dan, you're you're striking me as one of those Enterprise Vulcans you talk so much about in the actual yep. episode we did on Absolutely. Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite, mm-hmm. um, because Solok really is kind of reminiscent of those guys. Um, this is a see it for me because I mean we just waxed poetic about this episode uh, not all that long ago. It's one that I just love. I mean, you get to see what Cisco really obsesses about, and it's not catching Michael Eddington, and it's not being a Starfleet officer. It's baseball, and he just comes off the rails a little bit. So, um, yeah, definitely see it for me, Dan. 
Yeah, this is a definite see it for me. Um, we had, like you just talked about, Bill, we had the the uh, awesome discussion just a, a few weeks back uh, on this uh, very episode while we were in Albany at Northeast TrekCon. And and it was when the, the Red Sox were wrapping up a World Series championship and baseball is very important in my life. So this was a great episode. And, and to Norm's point, one of the things that I like so much about this episode, which is a little bit different than Norm's take on it, is this is a way to escape from the war, to escape from Jadzia's death and escape all the bad things that are going on around the station at that time. It's kind of an escape episode, which we've seen in different series uh, throughout the years. And and I thought it was placed in a very good spot right after Jadzia's death and Ezri's introduction. It's a definite see it. It's just a lot of fun for me. You know, I'm going to I'm going to caveat like when I say see it or skip it. The one thing I'm going to blanket statement about this entire season, I think that the production values are amazing, the acting is amazing, and the the connection with the characters are all amazing. But the way I was looking at it from a, a complete kind of a I guess almost virginal reviewer is what does it do for me in terms of moving mm-hmm. the lore forward? So I, I can understand that sure. and and yeah. um, make great points, Dan, because, you know, you're right. It is kind of like um, bringing a lot of levity to what was the very serious first few hours of Deep Space Nine. That's for sure. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, Camp Kittimer seems to agree with uh, with Dan and I. Um, only one person out of the respondents said they would skip this episode, if you can believe that. So that high could five. have been Norm for all we know. Yeah. High, high five to you, buddy. <laughs> Up top. Um, some of the verbatims on this, uh, fun without consequence, see it. Crying in baseball is illogical, but sulking is perfectly okay. See it? <laughs> I like that one. Uh, and then we've got a couple, find him and kill him. And then uh, death to the opposition. Uh, so lots of uh, great verbatims on this one. But uh, definite see it as far as Camp Kittimer goes. Way to go, campers. Well, I mean, I liked, I obviously in, I agreed with one person. So, I mean, this, that's, that's fantastic. That's 100% in my opinion. Um, <laughs> so let's go on to episode five, Chrysalis. Bashir falls for a genetically enhanced patient, Serena Douglas, that he brought out of a catatonic state using an ex- experimental medical procedure. I found this episode actually really interesting. Now, I don't really have a lot of history with kind of like the the patients that came on board and they were all like super geniuses and they were trying to yep. figure out and unlock the secrets of the universe. I found that all very interesting and they all performed their their roles very well. But there's there's one thing that I found consistent about Julian's character is that he's he's so desperately looking for that connection, you know, that one special person. And I found it really earnest of him to do what he what he does best and to use his genetically modified DNA to figure out medical things that people he's like the house of Deep Space Nine. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, he just he he can solve anything now now that we know that he's been genetically enhanced. But I felt that the performances, his performance in, in particular, was really good just because he's there's a longing that hasn't been resolved yet with him. And I think that after Jadzia died or was murdered, that there's that longing that will never be fulfilled. So that kind of propels his need to do something good for somebody further. And I just felt like it was interesting that he gave that woman a chance and then she had to go out and do something else. So that love is still unrequited. I like this episode a lot. Um, maybe it's the romantic in me. Maybe it's because I think that Julian's very charming, much like Esri does. So I say see it. Very interesting. I like that response. Now let's go. Dan Dan had like a kind of, man, this guy was not, we shouldn't have got him on the show, Bill. We should have left, <laughs> uh, we should have left him with the paw wraiths. You just kind of actually, you know, saved yourself a little bit because I gave this a see it. Uh, but I gave it a barely see it. Um, I like this episode. I don't love it. And one of the reasons is most of the time romance episodes fail in Star Trek. And this one almost does, but doesn't. Um, so I, I think I went with the see it based mostly on the fact that we get to see that those genetic misfits once again. And I did really like them in statistical probabilities. Um, so, so I gave it a see it. Um, but that's a stupid question, Bill. <laughs> um, it, it is. And unfortunately, I'm going to say skip it. Um, oh, I, first one. I know it's my first one. I don't like the episodes with the patients. I mean, uh, genetically engineered humans. And I could very easily skip this one. So I will. Here it is, kids. Here it comes. Meh. That's how I feel about Chrysalis. That's my first meh of the season. There may still be more. Now... <laughs> 
interesting to learn that after such a strong start to the season, the first four episodes, all high see it ratios from Camp Kittimer, this episode, almost straight down the middle, 54% of respondents said they would see this episode. <laughs> Among the skippets, here are some of the verbatims. Serena needs to get a restraining order against Bashir. Skip it. <laughs> Bashir is far too creepy. Skip it. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Trek medical ethics at their worst. Skip it. That was a fascinating <laughs> comment. I, uh, I I thought because I, I didn't think about it from those uh, that that perspective. Jack and friends are annoying. Skip it. Yes, I agree. And then here's my favorite. Meh. There's <laughs> the singing meh. Yeah. Singing? Really? Skip it. So those are the, uh, that's how Camp Kittimer feels about that one. 54% norm. Okay. Well, 54 is still um, uh, passing in someone's scale, I guess. Not <laughs> Bell curve. Bell yeah. Bell curve. Bell curve. So, I mean, there's, Everything hits everyone differently. That's what I love about Cedar Skippets. We do that on Blood of Kings, and people are like, mm. what are you, crazy, Norm? I'm like, yes, absolutely. Didn't you know that by now? So, yeah, I mean, the prism of seeing things is just so fun and so interesting to talk about. Episode 6, Treachery, Faith, and the Great River. A Vorta defector, Wayun 6, gives Odo valuable information in exchange for asylum, while Nog engages in a series of barters to get a graviton stabilizer for Miles. I love goofy stuff like this. I love goofy episodes because the the whole thing is like Miles. First of all, why would a chief give somebody like Nog, who he knows what could possibly go wrong with giving him his authority, his his signature to like sign off on things? Why would you do that? You're basically giving him the keys <laughs> to the kingdom, right? So, but it led for great character uh, interaction with with uh, with Miles and with Nog. So I I love that. And I thought that was interesting that the kind of like this rogue renegade Wayun didn't see uh, the the bigger picture or didn't agree with kind of like the Dominion strategy and wanted to work with Odo and, and kind of like, like like obviously he was uh, in 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 awe of his godhood. Uh, always great to see Jeffrey Combs in different ways. Um, for me, I thought it was a see. I thought it was a very compelling episode. I, I'm going to say see this. Nice. nice. Uh, let's see, Bill. Oh. Well, thanks. Um, I also will say, see this. This episode is so fantastic, but I do think it could stand to have a little more Jeff Combs. No? <laughs> Maybe? Um, what, what the idea. Doesn't? I know. Uh, tell me about it. The idea of a defecting Wayun is so interesting to me because it's a total abandonment of what the Vorta are. And it makes me wonder if there's a problem with their cloning process or some other issue that could have been explored further in the novels or in, in some other some other medium. So it's a definite see it for me. I, I love this episode. I love some of the scenes uh, with Renee. And, and, and I, I can't uh, say any more about this without stammering, Dan. Well, you did stammer a little bit, but but that's okay, Bill. Um, yeah, I, I, we're three for three on this one, guys, because this is a definite see it for me. This is actually the first time we ever see Jeff Combs talking to himself when Wayun Six is talking to Wayun Seven via view screen, and that's kind of a cool thing when you think about it. Um, it's a great episode to see how the mind of a Ferengi works to get something done with Nog and all the things that he does uh, to help out Miles. I think one of the most amazing moments of this episode is at the end when Rene reluct or Odo, I should say, reluctantly gives um, his blessing to Wayun Six after he um, turns on the the um, the chip that is going to kill him, and the look on Wayun Six's face is just priceless and worth the entire episode. It's fantastic. Definitely see it. Well, Camp Kittimer is right in there. I'd say about 83% of respondents said they would see it. A lot of love for Nog in the comments. Uh, more than a more than a few people said uh, they loved the whole Nog aspect to it. Uh, my favorite verbatim has to be, a defective Wayun is a more human Wayun. See it. And uh, funny and surprisingly beautiful. And I think I have to agree with that. Yeah. Um, and that w comment was obviously a see it. So uh, lots of love for this episode, Norm. Yeah, I... It's, again, one of those episodes where you can take it out of context of the season, but it still works really well because the, the relationships that they're forging are really, really well done. So good job, Camp Kenimer. You know, thanks for that vote of confidence for us, at least. Yeah. Uh, okay, so episode seven, Once More Unto the Breach. Kor asks Worf to find him a battle assignment, which Martok bristles at due to events in his past. 
Martok goes along with Worf's request as they prepare to attack a Dominion station. I was so emotionally perplexed with this episode, seeing Kor and seeing, because John Colicos as Kor is one of my all time favorite oh, yeah. Star Trek characters of all time. However, <laughs> seeing how they handled his legacy as this character, as towards the end of his years, I just didn't feel like whoever wrote that particular part of this story really understood what Core was trying to do and where he was trying to go. And I, under, I, I love that. I love, I love that Martok was like, you know what? He was kind of like, you know, he was the high noble Klingon. He shamed me when I was going through, uh, needed my, uh, you know, acceptance into the academy or, or whatever detail that was. And Martok's like, it was a great struggle between like nobility and common man. And I, I dug that. But I just didn't like that they were just making like core to be out this crazy dude just to like resolve himself at the end with a suicide mission. It didn't sit well for me. I didn't think that was core. Core was always, he was always the predator, you know, and not kind of like the curveball. Mm -hmm. So as much as I thought that the, the, the performances were great, I'm not a fan of how they handled core. So personally for me, this is a very emotional vote for skip for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dan, I, I don't disagree with anything you said, man. Um, I gave this a barely see it, and I'll give the specific reason why I gave it a see it in just a moment. But I think you're absolutely right. I think that the writers of Deep Space Nine went to the core well a little too much in Deep Space Nine. I do like the tension with Martok and how he feels about the Dahar Master and what happened in his past. I thought the way the Klingons treated Kor after he had his little mental setback was absolutely horrible and disgraceful. And I thought that the lack of actually seeing Kor die in a glorious battle was a huge miss. But out of respect for John Colicos, I'm going to give this a see it. That's really the only reason. Um, because there's a lot in this episode that you pointed out that's wrong. Bill? You know, I... I, I to me, Core is the Klingon of Klingons. I mean, he was the first. He was the best. He was the prototype for what Klingon should be. And for me, this episode is two core episodes too many. Um, they should have they should have not brought him back after Blood Oath. Mm -hmm. he, he's, there's two more appearances after that. This is the second of those two. Uh, give me Errand of Mercy any day. I will watch that 10 times. And unfortunately, I will skip once more into the breach. Um, I understand what they were trying to do. But like you said, Dan, this is just not the way that uh, Core should have gone out. Um, right. it, it should have been a, a blaze of glory and and not a, a, a kind of a lackluster effort. So um, Camp Kittimer actually is going to surprise you on this one. 93% uh, of respondents said that they would see this episode. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for some people, it was as simple as it's got core. See it. Um, nice. Yeah. Only Klingon focused episode I like. See it. Um, cry Havoc. I love that. See it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, that's uh, we're out of phase on this one with the camp. But uh, that always tends to happen in one of these episodes. Yeah, that's very interesting to me because um, I think we've talked about it before. You said it perfectly, Bill. This is two core episodes too much. Sort of Kalis is the other one, I think, for me that really just yep. didn't show the core character the way that it should have. It's kind of like they're like, okay, we need to keep bringing this guy back because he's loved and he's the original series character. And unfortunately, I think it it really dumbs down the importance and the popularity of core. I'm very shocked at the 93%. I think it's great. Everybody loves what every, some people hate. So it's interesting to see that diversity. I, it's, that's a shocker to me. Is it possible that a lot of the people that voted for this episode only really knew core from his introduction into deep space nine and don't really understand core from errand of mercy? Sure. Possible. That's very possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, because I think that we were bringing up those points. Also, Dan, I think that one thing that was really supremely missed here was the fact that you did not see Kor earn his his final scene, that final yeah. moment where, much like Chang, you know, at least you got to see his bridge blow up and he had that yep. great you know, to be or not to be moment. Core should have had that. I don't know why they cut away and it was just in passing. It it took all of the teeth out of the sacrifice that he made. Right. Absolutely. I agree hundred percent. Spot on. I, uh, now, I, so much I, I would have done differently about this episode. 
I'll say one other quick thing, uh, and this is uh, on that point, to have him just be there uh, in the turbo lift and say, long live the Empire, and that's the last time you see this amazing character, it was a, it was a huge swing and a miss, I thought. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Sorry, uh, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to um, use a personal override here and completely override whatever Camp Kittimer said. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying. He has that <laughs> don't, power. Don't turn these guys <laughs> off. Okay, so next episode, episode eight, The Siege of AR-558. Cisco and crew relieve Starfleet troops under siege by Jem Hadar at a key communications outpost. I entitled this in my review the band of brothers episode of deep space nine i really enjoyed the sheer grittiness the just the gravitas of this episode seeing frontline troops and the pressure and the paranoia that they had about those transporting or those invisible minds mm. they're you know it's that's a that's a side of Starfleet that I think that um, some people take uh, issue with when it comes to Deep Space Nine. It's not the Roddenberry, you know, Star Trek. These are frontline troops. I don't know why people wouldn't believe that there aren't frontline troops in what's called the Dominion War. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not the Dominion, you know, you know, uh, puff football what? fight, you know, or flag football, <laughs> you know. It's a war, and there are soldiers on the front line. They're dying for the values of the Federation. And I really thought that what happened to Nog was a really smart choice in seeing that one of the characters that you find so beloved in this crew, not necessarily a main character, but somebody who you find like, you know what, he's, he's Nog. And, and, and he gets wounded so severely. But also for me, I, I love this episode because Billy, Billy Mummy's in it from you know, Lost yeah. in Space and Babylon 5. And yeah. I love the relationship that he had with, with Esri talking science-like. You know, I thought that was actually really neat. So I'm going to, I'm pretty sure everyone's going to say see it because this, this episode was superb. This episode was amazing. So I say see it big time. Uh, Bill. Nice. So this is an exceptional hour of Star Trek. No, it, like Norm says, it's not positive. It is not filled with hope for a brighter future, but it is some outstanding drama and acting and it is absolutely worth watching. It's dark. But uh, but it is it is beautiful and it is fantastic. It's just it's a great hour. So this is an absolute see it, Dan. One hundred percent in agreement with both of you. This is a definite see it. We don't really ever see the horrors of war in Star Trek, and in particular, we really have never seen the horrors of the Dominion War during Deep Space Nine until this episode when we really saw it, and maybe we saw a little bit too much of it. Nog losing his leg was an absolute punch in my gut the first time I saw this episode. That howl that he made is something that I oh. just still get the hair standing oh. on my arm when, that, when yeah. I hear that. It is a brilliantly dark episode. And one of the things that I have always loved about Deep Space Nine, which is what some people hate about Deep Space Nine, is what Bill just mentioned. It's a darker Star Trek. And I think it's brilliant in the way they bring that darkness across. And this is a perfect example. Camp Kittimer, um, I got to say, delivers with their rating on this one. 97% of respondents said they would see this episode. Um, some people say must see, uh, ground battle in Star Trek. See it. One of the best deep space nine episodes. See it horrifying in a good way. I agree 100%. And lastly, one of Trek's darkest stories. Yes, that's a hundred percent true. So, uh, camp Kettimer right there with us, uh, 97%, uh, almost as high as it gets guys. I was about and to start singing. I'll be seeing you, but I'm not going to. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> So, episode nine, Covenant. Dukat, now a religious leader, holds Kira hostage. Mika, one of Dukat's followers, gives birth to a half Cardassian child. Hey. Sorry, that wasn't typed out. I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> so, very well done. I found this episode to be incredibly compelling because I've always loved episodes where certain fundamental morals. The, the majority of how people are are perceiving the certain fundamental morals of a religious sect like the Bajoran religion and the prophets are challenged 
when you have somebody who has just as dynamic and as charismatic as a leader as Dukat is, allows you to challenge those morals and kind of starts getting zealots on your side. Because now you're dealing with the which side of the religious right is the true right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that this is where they really started introducing it. So <laughs> with the exception of seeing like uh, the, you know, uh, Mika giving birth and like it's the uh, Cardassian child and it's a sign. It's a sign that <laughs> Dukat can't keep it in his pants. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. So I, I really liked this episode. I mean, I felt, I felt like uh, it was a great Kira episode. I mean, Kira was, was dupe, but she saw the other side. You know, she, she's so firm in her faith and so is the other Vedic, but the Vedic's like, the prophets turned on us. They, they aren't, the, they aren't the, the religious inspiration that they're supposed to be. I want to find somebody who's going to take action, who's going to deliver for us, who's going to be able to get things done for the Bajoran people. And when they brought up the paw race, I'm like, okay, I can see these two different sides of the religious equation does it make one any less right than the other just because yeah. someone else is, is furthering that cause. So I, I found that a really interesting, I find that very Star Trek-y. So I will say, see this episode. Let's say Bill. I also will say, see this episode. Um, with a series that features a race that is so inherently religious, I think it was just a matter of time before we had a crazy ass cult on Deep Space Nine. But I never expected Ducat was going to be the leader. You know, we really start to see Ducat's madness getting the better of him. And he starts down a road in this episode that there is absolutely no coming back from. And eventually the payoff is in the final episode. Plus, I think this episode is a little more relevant than than ever today, especially with all the focus on on some particular groups of of religious followers you know leah remini has a show on a and e right now that is pretty popular about examining scientology and although i'm not making a judgment on that but there are a lot of people who are looking at these things more closely and i think we can see uh, exactly what drives some of these organizations in their leadership so i think that this episode is prescient i think it's relevant even today and it's an absolute see it then Absolutely. I'm going to give it a see. One quick question I have for you guys, and, I, and, and I'm asking the listeners too, and, and let us know by, uh, by sending us a message. Is one of the followers in this cult the same guy who played the Vulcan captain in the Remick episode where they were trying to take over Starfleet? I'm going to have to look that up because I'm, I'm, I'm picturing that in my mind. It's just a random trivia question that I like to throw out there every once in a while. So I'll get back on track and get on the rails because – this episode shows how Ducat is completely off the rails, um, and he will use whatever means necessary uh, to exact revenge on Cisco and Bajor. And by that, I mean the Pa Wraiths and this and this cult. It's really eye opening to see him act one way in front of his followers, but then see you see his true self when he almost kills uh, the mother of his child, and then pretends that it's a sign. Um, but I also love the fact that uh, Karma's a bitch because they all turn on him when he pretends to want to die for the Pa race. And, oh, his non-lethal pill got mixed in with everybody else's lethal pill. It was just great. I thought it was a great way that this episode wrapped up. And we see Dukat, just like Bill said, he's going down a road and there's no coming back from it. It's a definite see it. Um, to clarify, um, Henry Darrow, who played the Admiral in that Next Gen episode, uh, where they're back at Starfleet Command and everybody had the the slugs, uh, is not the same guy in this episode, but he is the okay. same guy who plays Colapak in Star Trek Voyager. Chakotay okay, style. thank you. All right. um, I, oh, that's I, okay. I, yes, I knew it was somewhere. Yeah. So uh, Henry Darrow is just one. Of, he's one of those guys, you know, right. one of those actors you see in everything. Um, so uh, yet I digress. Camp Kittimer, um, 81% of respondents said that they would see this episode. Um one of my favorite comment has to be this Mark effing Alimo. See it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, uh, some people say I can take or leave it. Um, you know, it's a borderline. See it there. Uh, we had a couple of see it slash skip it. People who could have gone either way. Um, but I, I totally get where they're coming from on this one. I just, I have an appreciation for this episode that probably hits a little too close to home. So I mean, I'm just surprised that, because the last time you saw Goldicott was at the end of season six, and this is the first appearance of him nine episodes later in season seven, that people wouldn't be a little bit more on board with just seeing if you had Dukat fans saying, like, yeah, what happened? What happened to the Pa race like took him over and now what's going on? And now he's over in this like this alternate, not alternate, but like this, you know, he's in uh Tarok 
no and Pock Moore and Pock Moore. Yeah, so I would be like, yeah, my character's back, man. I'm on board. <laughs> Way to seduce all the uh, the local ladies to cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul, so as Paul yeah. Wraith brings all the chicks to the yard. Yeah. yeah well, one thing is, you know, there's a completely new definition for kind of like his uh, his religious staff. Um, but <laughs> um, <wild>. bum. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm here all night, folks. I'm here all night at Vix because we're going to Vix and episode 10. It's only a paper moon. Nog struggles with PTSD and begins living with Vic Fontaine. I, f- I found this episode to be utterly charming, completely charming. I loved um, Aaron's performance in this because you, I think that uh, in, in the siege of uh, AR558, you saw where Nog transitioned from stalwart and and um the defender of the federation and its principles to this where he became so small not just literally but figuratively small because he he lost the ideal he he lost what it meant to be what he wanted out of being a starfleet officer he saw his friends die he served with people who were killed alongside him he lost his leg he does no longer believe in the dream and he wants to escape reality in a hollow suite program. And I found that, okay, I know that um, there are, there are, or there have been documented stories of soldiers that they want to lose themselves in some type of alternate reality or altered reality, whether it's a uh, different universe, drugs, you know, however they want to get through their post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's interesting that Star Trek actually dealt with that very firsthand with a character that we loved and you can empathize with because he said that I don't want to go back into the real world because now I can be killed before his belief was like a bulletproof vest. It gave him certain Mm -hmm. moral invulnerability, mental invulnerability, but now that's gone. So his innocence has been lost. Where does that leave him now? And I found that very compelling to watch. So I'm going to say, see it. I'm sorry, Bill. Jeez. I'm terrible at this game. (laughs) No need to apologize. Um, I, too, am going to say see it. I mean, it's rare in Trek that we see a traumatic experience stay with a character because the nature of the show is just episodic at its core. Nog carries the events of AR-558 with him, and this episode does such a great job of giving him the ability to start healing somehow that doesn't involve just forgetting it happened and developing amnesia. So for that alone, because there's consequences and there's feelings, I say you have to see this episode, Dan. Yeah, it is a must see uh, for not only the development of the Dominion War, um, but to see what happens with Nog after the events of of AR five five eight. It's definitely a see it. I think this is the best Nog episode of the entire series of Deep Space Nine. Uh, Aaron does a phenomenal job with this episode, showing the trauma of war and how he's dealing with losing his leg. Um, and I can relate, uh, not so much to the the PTSD that that you talked about uh norm but i I've, I've there's been plenty of times where i wish i had a hollow suite that i could go hide in for a while um and i think that that aspect of this episode can probably touch a lot of people uh in similar ways and i gotta say it was a it was a gut punch for me when nog lost his leg but i can only imagine the gut punch that nog felt when vic turned off the program on him it, mm-hmm. it was a great moment in this episode uh and it's a definite definite see it you know, Cam Kittimer, right up there again, there's a high degree of response for season seven so far. 95% of respondents said they would see this episode. Um, people appreciate that it hits home with dealing with life-changing events and recovery. 100% see it. Um, let's see. A one-legged Ferengi walks into a bar. Dot, dot, dot. See it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the comment of the night right there and wow. uh yeah lastly well acted realistic consequences see it so uh definitely high praise for this episode and, and worthy of it also it would be remiss uh, if we didn't make mention of how amazing james darren was in this episode yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. and that's awesome I, I i love the fact that you had a holodeck program that has the capability of exacting tough love mm-hmm. has that conscious choice I think the best thing is, is there are two counselors on this station that aren't named as Redax. There's Garrick and there's Vic Fontaine. And really? so now all of a sudden that job's getting crowded. <laughs> yeah, for real. But I, I thought that he was great. I thought I loved just, I don't know, like I said, I don't know the show that well, but I really felt compelled to watch James Darren do what he did. It was just, I don't know, it, there was something special about that. 
Nice. Totally. Okay, so episode 11, Prodigal Daughter. Esri goes to New Sydney to find O'Brien and uncovers some disturbing family secrets. So this was the let's learn more about Esri story, which I find, you know, it's, it's responsible narrative that because we've only seen her and learned about her in response to how our favorite main characters have responded to her, but we've never really seen kind of like her past. Who is Esri separated from the Dax symbiote? And I thought the story was compelling, but again, with the thrust of what's going on with this, you know, the the the, the overall theme of this season, I didn't feel like, yeah, I gotta go watch this again. So I'm not, you know, I want to belabor the point. I thought that uh, Nicole was fantastic in this episode, and I thought the uh, plot was interesting, understanding her family dynamic, but it was kind of like a skip it for me. So I'm gonna say skip it. Uh, Bill, I'm sorry, I you, I did Bill last time. I'll say Dan. That's okay. Yeah. Bill's been going first all the time. What the hell? I'm sorry. I know. It's just <laughs> it's it's the way that this whole screen's formatted. I see. I read right to left. So, well, I got to tell you, I went ten episodes into season seven without having to say these two words. Skip it. I have always loathed this episode. I really can't tell you the exact reason why. Maybe it's because I hate seeing, uh, seeing the family issues that Esri has dealt with and continues to deal with. Her mother is just awful. Um, I, this episode makes me cringe. And for that reason alone, I can't recommend it as a see it. And that might be selfish to say that, but that's what I'm going with. So, uh, Bill, that's my first skip it of the season, buddy. Well, and we've reached probably our, you know, our biggest point of contention in this theater skip at the end, because I'm going to say, see this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I like this episode because it fills in some backstory for Esri. And I think that's really the only reason I enjoy it. Uh, we have a shortened time frame in which we get to know this character, really only 26 episodes. So I think they tried to pack a lot in here. It's just not terribly interesting. It's not DS9's greatest episode, but it's far from its worst. So for me, I I, I would watch this episode uh, again and again simply just because it's it's interesting, at least in that that aspect. Camp Kittimer, I, one of, this is another one of those where they're straight down the middle, guys. 52% of people said, see this episode. Um, <laughs> the verbatims, see above, I detest the character of Ezri Dax. Skip it. <laughs> So still not a lot of Ezreal from that that person. Um, meh. Hi, Bill. Skip it. <laughs> I like Ezri, but meh. Skip it. A couple of mehs. I'm very excited that this is permeating. Uh, Chill Society is interesting, but this one fell flat. Just barely see it. Okay. And then lastly, my meh. Skip it. So I got three mehs on an episode wow. that I didn't call a meh on. I think that's pretty so- awesome. Let me ask you this, Bill. You said that it was 52% see it for this? Yeah. That's so correct. that probably that makes this one the lowest rated skip it so far this season. Is am I correct in that? I think 54 was the last one. So mm-hmm. and so far, that's correct. Okay. Cool. I um I I don't want to spoil anything, but uh as I look across the numbers, um I think that's probably the lowest one. Wow. So everything is above 50%. That's a good thing. So far. At least above 52. (laughs) Exactly. So far. We still have about half a season to go. So let's go to episode 12. The Emperor's New Cloak. Quark and Rom cross into the alternate universe to rescue Grand Nagus Zek. Now, this is probably one of the first times in this season, watching the season seven, that I felt like, okay, this is the episode where they're starting to focus on particular either themes, events, characters, where they want to say goodbye to, because this is the alternate universe episode. And as much as I like the mirror universe episodes, uh, I'd never felt like this episode serviced being the story for a mirror universe episode as much as it is say, okay, let's wrap up some of the things that we needed to do for the mirror universe so we can add the mirror, u- the mer- much like they threw core in there. I felt like this was an episode where like, okay, let's address the mirror universe for the last time in season seven. So again, it looked great. The acting was great, but that's how I felt about it. So I'm going to say it was just a, let's get this out there for the fans. And that's not good enough for me. So that's a skip it for me. Uh, Dan. 
Well, everybody knows how much I love the Mirror Universe. Love it, love it, love it. Almost as much as I love Jazzia. But I'll tell you what, this is a skip it exclamation point episode for me. Um, I once said uh, that last season's Resurrection was the worst Mirror Universe episode ever. But I got to say, this is so close a second that they may overlap quite a bit. It's just awful. I, I, I have to be honest. I think it's awful. Vic is human in the Mirror Universe and not a hologram. That's just so stupid. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Um, and I got to say, this is one of the things that's been building over time. The oversexification of Mirror Kira is at its worst in this episode. And I just never liked how they portrayed the intendant in the Mirror Universe like that. To me, it took away the character. And I'm all one for beauty and and I'm very open with, with relationships and, and all that thing. So I'm fine with all that. I just think they put it on way too thick in the Mirror Universe episodes with Kira. And it took away from it. This is a horrible episode. It's a skip it, Bill. I, I think the takeaway here is that you hated a Mirror Universe episode. I mean, you've not liked <laughs> the last one. You, you sounded like you're full on hate this one. And uh <laughs> I have to tell you, this absolutely is the worst Mirror Universe episode ever. Um, <laughs> here comes my second meh. Meh. This is a skip it for me, 100%. Camp Kittimer, almost right down the middle on this one, 54% uh, of respondents. Slightly higher than the last episode said that they would see this episode. Um, some of the verbatims. Underwhelming final appearance of the Mirror episode. Well, final for Deep Space Nine anyway. Uh, but still a mirror episode. See it. I thought that was interesting. An enjoyable Ferengi mirror universe episode. Inconceivable. Skip it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, well. that's a great one. Just go with the silliness. See it. Boring mirror universe. Sorry, Dan. Skip it. That That's the verbatim. Sorry, Dan like is that. in there. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, one too many trips through the looking glass. That actually sums up my feelings uh, rather well skip it and then the last one don't judge me i like it see it okay and that's from the same person that hates as redax so um i think that's interesting also the the over sexification kind of extended to lead it towards the end also i'm like okay really mm. yeah true yeah. true right so so um hey guys i gotta say this i gotta jump in and say this here we go Trek Geeks will be right back for more See It or Skip It Deep Space Nine Season 7 after this message from Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Starships collection. You know, Dan, you're right. Uh, we love, we love, love, love Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Starships collection. Of course, it's officially authorized by CBS Studios. And this collection is only available from Eagle Moss Collections. It is the ultimate assortment of vessels from across the Star Trek universe, from the original series and Next Generation to Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Enterprise, all the way through the movies, and including Star Trek Beyond. Each of these gorgeous models, Dan, is made from die-cast metal and high-quality ABS materials. And then they're actually hand-painted with reference to the original CG models. And uh, where they exist, sometimes original photos of the original studio models, which I think is just as impressive. They are absolutely beautiful. And I'm sure as I'm going through my thoughts on this, you're going to be playing with your USS Enterprise and holding it like Apollo does in, in Who Mourns for Adonais. So you go right ahead and do that while I talk about how every ship also comes with an awesome and very solid display base, plus a collector's magazine featuring behind-the-scenes info, original design sketches, and a breakdown of technology used on board. Uh, It's great. Subscribing to the collection is very easy. In order to get your first ship, the USS Enterprise NCC-1701-D, for only $4.95 with free shipping, all you need to do is head on over to st-starships.com slash trekgeeks. And uh, additional models, and there are almost 150 of them right now, are going to ship twice a month and delivered directly to your door. Bill, I was actually on the Eagle Moss website today looking at ships, and I I, I saw some really great ones like the ISS Enterprise NX-01, which is just gorgeous. I saw the um, the Kremen Time Ship from Voyager, which is one of my favorite uh, episodes of Voyager from the, the Year of Hell. That was absolutely beautiful. 
There's just so many things out there to choose from. Um, and in 2019, we're going to be seeing new things like the space dock from Star Trek three, V'ger from Star Trek, the motion picture. And it's going to be interesting to see what that looks like. Um, Gom two from TNG's Tin man, and even the planet killer, from the TOS classic, the Doomsday Machine is going to be available next year. I can't wait to see these ships. So many dollars flying out of my wallet, Dan. That's what I hear you're saying about 2019. Now, of course, fans who'd like to purchase their favorite ships individually can do so for just a few dollars more, either online at shop.eaglemoss.com or, of course, at your local comic book shop. And, of course, sincere thanks to Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Starships collection for sponsoring this week's episode. So, episode 13, Field of Fire. Esri summons Duran, a homicidal Dax incarnation from her past, for help in understanding the mind of a serial killer loose on the station. So I call this Silence of the Lambs meets Deep Space Nine. Nice. Right. Um, I thought this was an interesting episode just for the sheer fact that there is a transporter technology sniper rifle. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, I felt that this was successful where Prodigal Daughter was unsuccessful in trying to explain away a lot of kind of Dax's personality. So for me, I really like this. The sniper rifle was way over the top for me on this. So I'm going to say, see it. Dan. All right. Well, I um, gave this one a see it as well. And you just hit the nail on the head, Norm. The only reason I gave this a see it is based on that amazing transporter bullet technology and how it gets fired and beamed into where it's going to strike the target. I just thought that was so cool. But I got to say, I'm a little tired of the Duran stuff, and it was a little boring to me. Um, but even with that being said, watching that that melon just explode with the, the beam in bullet was pretty cool. So I gave it a see it, Bill. Um. This is my second skip it in a row. It's the first time I reached this in in this particular see it or skip it episode. Um, this episode for me is a little mad, but I think it would have been better served in an earlier season of Deep Space Nine. There is some nice stuff here for Nicole DeBoer to do, but uh, ultimately I think the script isn't all that strong. And actually, Norm, I like to refer to this as the silence of the voles. Um, <laughs> that's just a, that's kind of a nice coincidence that you came up with that there. So yeah, for me, this is a definite skip it. I like Esri. I'm just not a big fan of this episode. Uh, Camp Kittimer, however, more of a fan of this episode than I am. 75% of respondents, three out of four, said they would see this episode. Now, conversely, and somewhat diametrically opposed to me, um, one of the few Esri stories totally worth the watch, see it. Vulcan (laughs) Assassin, see it. Uh, More weird changed Duran backstory, skip it. And then lastly... Our Esri uh, person says, I know I detest the character of Esri Dax, but this episode was pretty good for me. See it. Interesting. So honestly, I appreciate that. Yeah, I was a little bummed that the the Asian brother and uh, awesome pilot of the Defiant got smoked at the beginning of the episode. So (laughs) (laughs) I was like, man, it's like, like me and uh, Chris Bunyay and Michael Wynn and Will Wynn, we could all cut a cosplay of this guy and maybe I'll just like do it with a giant bullet hole in my chest. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on to episode 14, Chimera. A changeling, Loss, asks Odo to leave the station and join his search for other shapeshifters. I really like this episode for the sheer fact that I felt it was very Star trek I felt that because Odo found another of his kind, this Lost 100 that went out there to to find and, and develop themselves, I liked how this particular shapeshifter, Loss, was very brusque and very kind of uh, clinical and in in his um relationship to all the other people in the station where Odo was kind of like, you know, he was humanized. So all of the crew and all of Odo's friends kind of kept loss at a distance and didn't really kind of like embrace him and welcome in his outlook on life. And I was like, I thought that was the whole kind of meaning behind, you know, exploring strange new worlds and seeking out new life forms. So I, I like that there was that challenge in that episode. So for me, I'd like, I'm saying see it for Chimera. How about you, Bill? I'm going to agree with you completely. I like this episode because it gives us a look at just how conflicted Odo really is regarding the founders. Plus, I think there's some great exchanges here between Loss and Odo and Loss and Kira. 
Um, I, like you said, it's very Star Trek. I think it's a good placement for this episode. And it reminds us that amid all this war that we can actually have some, some Star Trek based uh, content in, in this final season of deep space nine. So for me, Dan, it's a see it. Yeah, this is a see it for me too. I really love this episode. And it's funny because I think the first time that I saw it, it took me like half the episode to realize that it was our good friend, JG Hertzler, who was Laz because he was credited with a different name at the beginning of the episode. But, uh, I love JG. Everybody knows that. And it was good to see him in Star Trek in a different way than what we're used to with general Martok. And I really just love this episode. I, I like what you said, Bill. It shows how conflicted Odo is with the founders. And it shows why changelings are so isolated. And unfortunately, this episode shows that racism is sadly alive and well, even in the 24th century. I, I, I love this episode and to see it. Yeah, for me, it brought up one of probably like my fam- favorite moments in the original series. And that was during uh, the... Um, Balance of Terror, where Lieutenant Stiles was so supremely racist to Spock. Mm-hmm. And then where Kirk says, there's no bigotry on my bridge, leave it in your quarters. Uh, that exists still. And for me, I always think that that's a really interesting point to always revisit, even in the universe of Star Trek, because it just doesn't disappear. So um, I think we are all in agreement with that, which is fantastic. So episode 15, bada bing, bada bang. The crew attempt to help Vic Fontaine when Vic's hotel is brought by mobster Frankie Eyes and Carl Zemo. You know what I'm saying? Give me a slice. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, this is one of those, again, we had a lot of heavy episodes, especially after Chimera and Field of Fire. A lot of heavy episodes. You have to have that kind of palate cleanser episode. Again, it, there's a lot of participation in there. Great Vic Fontaine episode. A lot of fun with the holodeck. A lot of fun with the fact that the holodeck goes rogue. It just kind of like changes its programming because of this jack-in-the-box virus. However, as much as I love the dynamic of this episode, again, it's just this one that kind of keeps furthering along the lore for me in Deep Space Nine. So I liked what I watched. I thought it was a lot of fun and everyone had a good time doing it, but I don't think I really need to see it again. So I'm going to say skip it. That's just me. Uh, how about you, Dan? I don't want to talk to you anymore. this is one of my favorite episodes i think this is probably the best holodeck slash hollow suite episodes of all time it is fantastically written and fantastically acted by everybody involved we get to see uh, robert o'reilly again outside of his gowron makeup which is always cool um and i just i just love this episode i think it i think it was a lot of fun and it looks like the cast had a lot of fun doing it so it's definite see it for me bill well you know dan uh, as i recall this might be episode 110 of the trek geeks podcast in which we devoted hmm. a full hour to uh bada bing bada bang it was right before stlv 2018 and uh what a great time it was um or 2017 i think actually sorry my bad um right, yeah. We, I love this episode. I just think it's fun. I love the Rat Pack era movies. I love the whole 60s vibe. And this episode just hits on all cylinders for me. So it's an absolute see it. And luckily, Cam Kittimer is right there with us. 93% of respondents said see it. Uh, one person said they watch it every year before leaving for STLV to set the Vegas mood, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I may have awesome. to start doing that myself. So uh, that's a, a fun, a fun episode, especially at this point of the season. Where's my if money, I, Frankie? If I may, <laughs> if I may, though, um, crooning Benjamin Sisko is best Benjamin Sisko. <laughs> oh, yeah, better than Yelly yes. Sisko any day. Wow. <laughs> and again, I, I'm agreement with, I think this was well acted. There's a lot of great energy, and it's a fantastic episode. But a lot of, when I, when I do a see it or skip it list, I want to see how it moves the overall storyline lore so for that as an individual episode if you want to show me that and say like hey this is star trek i'm like yeah that's fine i love it um but again that's just kind of like where my caveat goes with with judging these episodes so sure. moving on so- sorry camp kittimer you guys are right i'm wrong <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see i don't i don't do this language so i'm gonna do my best uh, episode 16 inter arma <laughs> enum silet legis nice While attending- that's pretty good. thank you while attending a diplomatic conference on Romulus, Bashir becomes an unwilling pawn of Section 31. Two words. Luther. Sloan. See it? It is amazing. This episode is amazing. The politics, the Romulan conspiracy, 
Luther Sloan maneuvering more ways than you can possibly imagine. The chess match. Bashir just being completely and utterly used to the point where hopefully he learns something from it. And Bill Sadler killing it in this episode. See it, Bill. Yeah, ab- all of those things. It's one of my favorite Deep Space Nine episodes of all time. Plus, Adrienne Barbeau, my friends. <laughs> you know, we're all of a particular age. And I think we all grew up with crushes on Adrienne Barbeau. I'm just saying. Um you, this is another one of those episodes that we felt we had to cover this year for Trek Geeks, Dan, and uh, with good reason. It is fantastic television, my friend. It is a fantastic episode. Our good buddy William Sadler does a fantastic job in this episode. Section 31, Bashir, Sloan, Romulans, Ross, Eremotic Syndrome. What can you not dislike what can you not like what can you not just like i can't even talk i'm so excited about this episode so it's a see it i'm just gonna leave it at that i can't well 100 percent of camp kittermer respondents said they would see this episode unanimity on inter arma einem sealant leg ass boys and the only verbatim for this episode is scary manipulation of bashir's decency yeah yeah that's exactly what it is and i think it reminds us about how um, how that happens probably in everyday life. And sometimes we don't even realize it, but Bashir does. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. So episode 17 penumbra as researches for a missing wharf, Cisco makes plan plans to marry Cassidy Yates. So I have kind of a mixed feeling about this episode because I feel like this is one of those, another, like a, a trilogy of episodes that I can't like, I can't weigh on this one specifically because it keeps continuing. The storyline keeps continuing to a, to the resolution of, uh, what, two episodes later. I like it. I'm not going to say skip it because you can't skip it or else you can't make sense of the other episodes. So, mm-hmm. But I also like the fact that, uh, you know, Worf, albeit off camera, you know, he goes to do a mission and he survives. Uh, but, you know, Esri um, starts connecting with her Jadzia. And again, Cisco makes the whole thing with like, well, I got to I got to move forward with my relationship here. So like there's a lot of tying up of loose threads that are going on in this episode. They don't all pay off in this episode, but I can't say skip it because you have to see it or else the other episodes don't make sense. So I say see it. How about you, Bill? I agree with you. You know, you figured that in reality, this is the first part of a 10 part finale and they designed it that way on purpose to sort of try to wrap the whole series up. And I think it's a must see. I also think there's some interesting and really valuable stuff between Esri and Worf here. Um, some of it's a little throwaway. Yeah, that that's a hundred percent true, but I think there are some really great character stuff here. And I mean, they are at some point going to be forced to like confront some things that they neither of them have wanted to unpack, especially in the wake of Jadzia's death. So uh, this is an absolute see it for me, Dan. Yeah, it's a definite see it for me. But I got to say, really, Esri, you got to make static sounds to say that there's communication problems when Cisco's trying to get you to turn around. What are you, like 10? Uh, <laughs> exactly. That was the, that was very Han Solo of her. A situation <laughs> yeah. normal. Yeah. But We're on the other hand... <laughs> Very nice, very nice. But on the other hand, you know, at least she get to have sex with Worf. Uh, so that makes me want to ask, how many people did Dax actually sleep with on this show anyway? Whatever incant- incantation, incarnation of Dax, I don't know. There was a lot of people. Captain Baudet with the transparent skull. I'll just leave it at that. But for me, the big moment in this episode is when Ducat walked into Damar's quarters as a Bajoran. That was awesome awesome and set the tone for what this final uh, arc of the series was going to be like. And I loved it. So it's a see it. Camp Kittimer right there, 84 and set point seven five percent So almost 85% of people said they would, they would see this episode uh, enough of wharf skip it. Okay. All right. I, I get it. Uh, <laughs> less exciting than I would hope. Skip it. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, I, I got nothing. Um, and in fact, there's some verbatims that, that, that don't really read well individually, but at the end, I'll have to tell you about the sentence that some of these verbatims make because there's one word in the response. <laughs> yeah. So to be continued norm. All righty. So let's continue with episode 18 till death do us part captured by the brain. Esri and Worf undergo mental torture. 
Cisco agonizes over his broken engagement. Now, again, I didn't really see this as the 10 part series finale, but it makes a lot of sense because a lot of things are going lockstep with how the storyline's unfolding. One of the things I actually did like about this episode was the the moment that Quark brought that really expensive diamond ring to Cisco. And he's like, are you really going to throw away this moment in your life for whatever reason? And I love how one of the things I, I love is that that um, Avery or, or Cisco, he kind of wrestles with the fact that I'm the emissary, but does that mean that I don't have free will anymore? And I love how he and Penny Johnson Gerald or, or Cassidy work together. So I, I always find the two of them very compelling to watch because they're so very honest as actors. Uh, I, I, I mean, you have to see this episode again because it, it continues the storyline with the Breen, uh, the exploration of of Worf and and Dax's relationship, but also the Breen, which I found compelling. So and obviously they are a huge game changer in the uh, the the momentum of the war. Uh, that's all I really have to say. I say, see it, Bill. I'm right there with you. Um, I really kind of like the Esri Wharf stuff in, in in the part of this episode, and I think it's great to see Mark Alimo, um just in full on Bajoran mode um, for for a good chunk of this. There's, there's so much here. I don't think you can really miss this one. Um, and I, I mean, I could go on and on about this episode, but like it's it's just the beginning of a multi part finale. I think it carries the action forward very well. And I don't think that there's really any wasted moments in this episode, Dan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a see it. I love Ducat playing Angel Tanan, the simple farmer from the land. And I love how those tricky pa race play with Kai Wynn the way that they do uh, with her first vision of what she thinks are the prophets to just not be the prophets. I thought that was great. And I got to say, just... The alliance between the Dominion and the Breen changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, Jeffrey Combs is the definition of smooth, and this sets everything up just so wonderfully. So it's a see it for me, too. Yeah, and you're the opposite of the definition of smooth, Dan. Very Thank nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cam that. Kittimer, 89.83% said they would see this episode. Not a lot of verbatims here, but the one that stands out probably is the Ducat win scenes make up for most of the Esri wharf scenes. See it. Um, I thought that was interesting, but okay. Um, nice. I actually like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as smooth as a gem Hadar's backside. So just saying <laughs> anyway, so I, I I'm, I'm remiss to say that I didn't mention anything about Louise Fletcher as Kai Wynn, And she is oh, every wow. single time she walks yeah. on screen. I'm like, Yep. Wow. Yep. The, 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 there's no, like she loses no potency, like uh, further along in her career that she gets. Cause we all loved her as nurse Fletcher, you know, in one flew over the cuckoo's mm-hmm. nest, but her, she has such great, like a um, menace behind her eyes without being menacing. You know, there's a silent Absolutely. threat that she always carries about her. So continuing on with gold to cut or angel and Kai Wen, strange bedfellows episode 19, an alliance is born between the Dominion and the Breen, which will prove devastating for the Federation. Now, I don't know a lot about the Breen, but what I realize is that they are a power struggle shift. Um, it, I have to ask you guys. I like this episode, so I'm going to say see it, and you guys can expound on it. But one thing I'm just curious about is, did they ever explore the Breen in terms of their the influence, the, the power-based influence that they have in the Alpha Quadrant? Nope. Um, Dan. Nope. Not at all. Other than the fact that they're the same species that um, Princess Leia dresses up as in Return of the Jedi, um, there's really not much that we know about them. <clears throat> um, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but um, okay. this is a this is a see it episode for me. Uh, Worf snaps Wayun's neck. Damar laughs. Damar is just so happy to see the new Wayun. And I think. Perhaps you should talk to Worf is maybe the best one-liners in the entire series, if not all of Star Trek. It is uh, Casey Biggs is genius in this episode just for those couple of scenes, and it's a see it for me, Bill. I'm right there with you. I mean, the um, the thing I like about a 10-hour finale is that there's just an opportunity to tell a lot of stories that are all pretty much guaranteed to have a payoff. And uh, there's no loose ends in this episode. Plus, uh, Damar for the win, baby. 
Um, <laughs> I, I love that that turn in this episode, and it sets up so much for the remaining few episodes. So this is an absolute see it for me. Camp Kittimer thinks Strange Bedfellows is right up there too. 94% of respondents would see this episode. Um, <laughs> my favorite verbatim here is, don't get me wrong, Kai, Wynn, and Ducat are creepy together, but see it. Just see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Casey Biggs, he he killed it in this episode. And a sober Damar is a dangerous Damar. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. hands down. Yeah. Yes. Now, is this the ep- this is the episode where he where he throws the the canard at the in the mirror? Is that correct? Or was that the previous episode? I forget. But that's a brilliant scene in itself. They all blend together. That's the problem. In yeah. This, yeah. In this exactly. Finale. Yeah. But yeah. you figure, you know, he he decides to take the rebellion and put it on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that alone, I mean, it's just it's it's so clutch yeah. for the rest of the series. Yeah. yeah, it is. So in episode twenty, the changing face of evil. The war reaches a crucial turning point when the Dominion retakes the Chintaka system while Damar leads a revolt against the Dominion. I want to say Chintaka like Shatner, like Chintaka system. Um, <laughs> what, what I loved about this episode was, again, you're, you're seeing how, how all of these characters that you believed were a certain way were all being kind of turned on their heads. You know, you don't really like... Like Damar, Damar is like for the entire season, he was okay. Let's you know, let's continue the war. I'm kind of like the string puppet of the Dominion. But then there are all of these, I guess, these realizations, these moments of clarity that he's having because he's like kicked the canar and he now understands that with the brain there, all the Cardassians are are cannon fodder for the Dominion, and that's yep. not what he wanted. That's he wanted to bring a greater glory of his people. And separate themselves as a, as their own so, you know supreme solo power with honor with glory, but that's not they are now kind of like the dogs of the war, the dregs of the war. And he's like, no, this can't be. This isn't the road that we're supposed to be on. And then the relationship that Kai Wen and Dukat have is just weird and awesomely strange to watch. <laughs> but is this, I, I this feel- is the one. This is the one where he loses his sight. Yes, he's like looking at the 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 Pa Wraith book and then that flame kind of shoots through his eyes and he's like I can't see um, <laughs> yeah I I, I I need eye bleach for whenever they're together quite honestly um, and, and I wish I were as blind as Tukat winds up so uh, I'm <laughs> just for the sheer fact that I love saying Jindaka system uh, I'm gonna say see this episode no I'm serious I mean this the, I think that Casey Biggs he's he's really for me getting his due in these last couple episodes. Totally. Damar is so good. He's so good. And I think that he's he's making that turn in a character where like, oh, okay, this is who the character is supposed to be. And it's very compelling to watch. I say, see it. How about you, Bill? Uh, I'm right there with you. I mean, the brain attack Earth, the Defiant is destroyed. Oh, Cardassian uh, Rebellion. I remember asking myself when this was first broadcast, where could they possibly go from here? And even now I marvel at how solid this episode is. For, so for me, Dan, this is an absolute see it. It just, this finale is heading forth at a breakneck pace. Yeah, you said they, they outdo themselves every episode pretty much going forward. This is a definite see it. Oh my God, this episode has just so much emotion in it. You got the Costa Mojin and you have poor Solbar getting stabbed in the back by the now revealed Dukat. You've got Damar starting the revolt against the Dominion, but holy shit, the destruction of the Defiant. I mean, it literally is painful to this day for me to watch that scene. And then with the female changeling letting the survivors go because it will instill fear in the Federation, all I got to say is the founder is wise. (laughs) Well said. Oh, my God. That's pretty good. That was Uh, awesome. Kim Kittimer um, thinks that the founders are wise to 97% wow. uh, said they would see this episode and rightfully so. Um, uh, my, my favorite comment is the one that tugs at my heartstrings a little bit. Goodbye, Defiant. See it. Mm. Yeah. Ugh. God, I love that ship. Mm-hmm. I always found it. I found it interesting that, you know, because the Defiant is so legendary and it's legendary for for a variety of reasons. But all of a sudden, this new race comes in with an energy dampening technology. And you're like, geez, like, you know, that's (laughs) talk about a surprise. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, so even more surprises are in store for episode 21, When It Rains. Cisco orders Kira to train Cardassians in resistance tactics as Damar's Rebellions gains ground. Meanwhile, Bashir makes a shocking discovery about the disease that is ravaging the founders. This is a heavy episode. Heavy episode. Yeah. And what I loved about it is that it's kind of like a turnabout is fair play when it comes to morals. Because I love the scene when Cisco says, Major or Colonel, excuse me, Colonel, you have to put your feelings aside. The Cardassians, DeMar, this, they are the right play. You got to train them in being these guerrilla terrorists to, in order to support the Cardassian rebellion. Um, also, because I'm a huge Babylon 5 fan, uh, DeMar's second in command is played by John Victory, who played Neroon, Shailit Neroon, who was a major character in Babylon 5. I, I, I could spot him nice. through the, mm -hmm. the makeup in a moment's notice. So anyway, amazing episode. And more Section 31 and more shenaniganry mm -hmm. with Starfleet Medical and the fact that they poisoned Odo to poison the founders. That is a long play for section 31. Brilliant. How about you, Dan? Well, yeah, this is definitely a see it. The buildup for the finale continues strongly. This is the episode that actually Ducat uh, was punished and blinded. Was he punished for looking at the coast of Mojin or was he punished for sleeping with Kai Wynn? I will let you folks decide. <laughs> um, but, you know, as you just mentioned, Norm, the final seeds for a section 31 episode are planted here. Um, Additionally, the Breen are badass, but O'Brien knows how to counteract that weapon. So that's another good uh, little plot. And the tension between Kira and Rasat is palpable here and makes for some intense drama in this episode. It's Everything's great in this episode. It's a definite see it. What about you, Bill? You know, this one's a see it for me. This episode is like a great middle act of a play. I mean, there's a lot that's set up for the second half of the finale arc. Plus, we get to see Commander Kira Norris in her Starfleet uniform, a twist I just absolutely loved. Uh, so mm -hmm. this one's a see it for me. Camp Kittimer, uh, once again, right there with us, 98% of <laughs> respondents said they would see this episode. So uh, when it rains, it definitely pours, gents. And uh, wow, it's hard to believe we're coming into the end of this, the season here. You know what the toughest thing is about sailing, about sailing a ship like the Defiant or now the Sao Paulo when we get to it, is you can't tack into the wind successfully. So in episode 22, tacking into the wind, Kira masterminds a plot to steal the Breen energy dampening weapon and Worf instigates a power shift in the Klingon Empire. So this is where Gowron returns if I remember correctly, right? And he Correct. makes he makes the play to to honor General Martok at the same time with the deafness of a Romulan politician, remove him of command of the Klingon forces that have been fighting this Dominion War for like the last two years. Worf sees this. It's very well apparent that Gowron wants the he wants the glory, but doesn't have the ability. And I found that it was interesting to see the the Klingon dynamic come back again. I really like this episode for the sheer fact that I have had the opportunity to meet both uh, Robert Riley and John Hertzler at the same time at the convention in, in uh, the 50th anniversary. I love both those guys. They're fantastic. But this episode is fantastic. I say see it. And let's see what else. Do. Oh, and also... Um, the whole, like, uh, it was a very Star Wars where they were trying to steal the ship. They were like, hey, um, hi, guys, I'm the Vorta. Uh, everything's okay. Uh, hopefully you don't find us out. We're all good here. How are Thanks. you? How are you? Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Bill? That tricky little um, Yeah, I, uh, I like this episode a lot. I like that Gowron meets his end here. And what a death he has. I mean, I'm so glad that it's at Worf's hands for all the crap that he put the House of Moog through. Um, no, I'm not carrying a grudge at all, am I? Nah, not a bit. Uh, this one's a see it for me, Dan. Yeah, this is a see it for me as well. I've always loved the Gowron character. I wasn't happy with how the writers decided to make Gowron a power-hungry narcissist who wanted all the glory for himself here instead of wanting to win the war at whatever costs. Uh, but in the long run, it made for a great way for him uh, to battle Worf to the death, and then we all get to finally hail Chancellor Martok. So it's a definite see it for me as well. 
do you, do you think that that choice was made to show the dichotomy between like a noble house, noble born, high born Klingon versus the common man Klingon? I actually looked at it as what someone who's just a politician is like versus someone who is actually in the trenches and doing battle and being a leader of forces instead of just being someone who is sitting up on a throne telling people what Mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. I think they, they do set up Galron as a narcissist and I believe he is a narcissist. And I also think he's more of a warrior on paper, whereas Martok is an actual warrior. Um, so I, I, I was kind of glad he met his, his end in this episode. Um, I was very pleased with how it happened. And, um, so, so there, Dan, take that poopy head. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, oh, by the way, Camp Kittimer, yeah, Camp 98%, Kittimer. <laughs> 98% gents. So, uh, um, not a lot of, uh, verbatims there other than by Gowron. <laughs> Way to almost ignore the fans there, buddy. I love that. <laughs> Wow, so, what a jerk. <laughs> don't be so extreme in your measures, Dan, because we will be talking oh, oh, about episode nice. 23, Extreme Measures. As Odo falls gravely ill to the shapeshifter disease, Bashir and O'Brien must get inside the mind of Luther Sloan, who holds Odo's cure. Two words. Luther Sloan. Luther. Oh my yeah. God. This, I mean... I don't know. I, I, I've always loved uh, Bill Sadler as an actor with all those various roles, but there's just something about the Luther Sloan character and just how nonchalant he is about the, the, the global responsibility that Section 31 is pretty much like um, uh, maneuvering all throughout Starfleet to the point where they are planning genocide against an entire species. How not Starfleet is that, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's like, that's not something that you would think about. It's like, what are you watching, Norm? Star Trek. That's the show about like, you know, high morals and looking towards the galaxy for a better future for humanity. Yes. What is the episode you watched? I watched where they planned on actually killing an entire race of beings from planting an actual virus in those beings from the very get go. I love that show. (laughs) (laughs) Too much? No, no, no. I'm right there with you. Anywho, so I think that's – I always love um, these episodes that f- make you face the moral dilemma. Also, I really liked uh, how O'Brien just without moments hesitation, I'm going into that matrix with you, Julian. I don't care what happens. You're my, bro- you're my boy. You're my bro. And somebody has to be the voice of reason to get you out of there, which I thought that was a really nice performance there by uh, Cole Meany. So that's an absolute C, extreme measures. How about you, Dan? Yeah, this is definitely a C. Section, any Section 31 episode is pretty much going to be a C it in my book. Um, I love Bill Sadler and what he's done um, with this character and with the creation of Section 31. Uh, it's a great – I guess the only thing that I really don't like about this episode is that it's the end of Luther Sloan. Um, and, and that's very sad. I would have loved to have seen him more – somewhere somehow if at all possible but it's a see it for for if nothing more than to see flaky odo no literally yeah. flaky odo that's just so awesome so it's a see it for me bill as opposed to listening to flaky dan each and every week on the podcast <laughs> um, oh. this one's a see it for me when i first saw this episode i didn't like it a whole lot but i think it in hindsight it tells such a great story and i think it's the perfect downshift before the final three hours of the series. So for me, this one's a see it. Uh, Camp Kittimer is right there with us. 94.92% nice. said they would see this episode. Uh, people, great episode, but I felt underwhelming as a wrap up to section 31. That's not a horrible take on this episode. Uh, borderline torture Bashir hard to swallow. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Uh, Bill Sadler steals this episode even when he's brain dead. See it. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, that's Camp Kittimer. And uh, we have to, sorry, we have to power through these next two because I have seven minutes left. All right. So the next two are Dogs of War. Episode 24. Cisco takes command of a new ship. Kira and Garrick face a Dominion ambush on Cardassia. The Sao Paulo turns into the Defiant. Amazing. Kira leading a resistance with Damar. Amazing. See it. Go. Bill. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> see it and I, I would follow that up with hello ship 
Um, mm. I love that moment. It's This is the penultimate episode of the series, and it brings us a new Defiant, a new Nagus, and a new pregnancy, all of which are very exciting, which means probably horrible things for the finale, usually. <laughs> Plus, this is Avery Brooks' final directorial effort for Deep Space Nine, and I think that he really does a fantastic job with this episode. There's a lot of shots here. It's very complex, and I think that he takes what could be a a, a very dicey episode and carries it forth with great skill. So this is a definite see it, Dan. Yeah, it's a brilliant, a brilliantly directed episode. I love it. Preparing for that final battle, the new Defiant, Cassidy is Prego, and Hale... All hail Grand Nagus Rom. It's just fantastic. What I like about this episode is that there's a lot of great plot threads that are starting to be tied up here. Much disla- not like Lost. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm going to leave that. All righty <laughs> then. So here we are. Um, I'm well, sorry. Uh, Cam, Cam, Cam Kidman real quick. Sorry, guys. 100% kids. Uh, absolute right. see it. Uh, somebody says they're still following the Cardassian resistance. See it. And then I remember I said there was some one word verbatims. Uh, they culminated with this episode. And if you read them together as one block, it says you have to see all these episodes, exclamation points. Um, so that's how, <laughs> that's how one respondent felt about this, this lead up to the finale. So hundred percent. Nice. It's almost like I don't have to vote for the last one. I mean, we're at episode 26. <laughs> it is the, it is the season and series finale of Deep Space Nine, or is it? Cisco takes what you leave behind. Cisco leads the Federation Klingon Romulan Alliance in the offensive on the Cardassian homeworld. Dakot and Wynn journey to the fire caves to release the Pa Wraiths, and Damar leads his people in a revolution in an attempt to overthrow their Dominion oppressors. There's nothing that I can say that hasn't been said before about this two part finale. It is one of the best moments of Star Trek history, period. See it. End of story, Dan. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to put it this way. This may be the best finale of them all. I'm biased because Deep Space Nine is my favorite series, but this finale is a thousand times better than the final episode of MASH, which people consider to be the top of all finales. And I don't think it's even close to what is here in What You Leave Behind. It's just so wonderful. The scene with the major cast members being shown with the theme of deep space nine mixed in with the way you look tonight makes me cry every single time I watch it. And the pull away shot of Jake Kira and the station makes my inside hollow knowing that the series is over bill. Uh, yeah. I mean, this, this finale is, is so bittersweet and it's so perfect. It, there are a couple of missed opportunities here that are so minor in the scope of how epic this finale is in its conclusion. I'm sad it's over every time I see it. And then I start right back with Emissary to remember how great it all truly was. This is uh, one of the finest finales of any series that has ever graced television. And it's an absolute see it. And boys, Camp Kittimer, their second 100% in a row, which has never happened in see it or skip it, is with the Deep Space Nine series finale, what you leave behind. Uh, everybody, a lot of people saying the best conclusion of a series, hands down, one of the best closers, fantastic ending to a great season and phenomenal show, uh, awful cost of war shown on Cardassia. Um, though I really miss Jadzi in this one, quite a selective memory you have, Esri, uh, tearjerker ending. Uh, you never have to see Keiko again. See it. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> Uh, oh, can you ask, can you ask for a better finale? See it. And then lastly, one respondent was just all hearts. So gentlemen, season seven wrapped up an amazing see it or skip it. Let's talk percentages guys, because they're, they're quite interesting. I think, um, I'm going to start with you, Bill. Uh, you were 22 for 26 for an 84.62% for season seven. What do you think? You think that's higher or lower than you expected? Um, that's lower than I expected, but it, it ties my, my second highest rating of, of all seven seasons with season four, mm-hmm. but it's below my, my highest rating of season five. So 
I find it interesting that there's so much here in season seven, but yet I like season five just a bit more percentage wise. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Um, I was surprised Norm came in at 21 of 26 for an 80.77 percentile, which is respectable. Uh, But as I look at the total for my season seven, which I absolutely love season seven, I came in with only two skippets for the year, 24 of 26 for 92.31% of see it, which is really high. And it actually ties season four for my highest season. So I'm a love in season four and I'm a love in season seven, sir. Well, we're a <laughs> love Mr. Norman Lau. Norm, thank you for taking us through season seven. It was our honor and pleasure to have you on board for, for this as we wrap up deep space nine's 25th anniversary season. And uh, how can people find you online, brother? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Second of all, I'm I'm sorry that I ate up so much of your airtime because we had to like kind of like power through the the final like uh, third act of this uh, incredible series and season. But you can find me online at Zocalocast. That's Z O C A L O C A S T. Zocalo in Espanol meaning the Great Marketplace. It is also where Babylon Five did all of its commerce. So you can find me there on Twitter and on Instagram. And please Gmail me at Zocalocast at gmail.com. Back to you, Bill. Dan, we, of course, have to thank our fantastic friends, the five gentlemen who are part of the band Five Year Mission, without whom this podcast would have a whole lot more Dan Davidson, and nobody wants that, my friend. Trust oh. me. Wow. Oh. Okay. It's true. It's true. We <laughs> there there have been studies performed. <laughs> well, I gotta say, we love them. We love their albums. We love their music. And I have a special message that I would like to read from a friend of mine in the voice of that friend of mine, if I may. Uh, okay. Well, before you do that, I'm gonna say, want everyone to head on to fiveyearmission.net. Download all their albums. Seriously, <laughs> do it. Okay, go ahead. No, I was gonna do that too, but that's fine. I'll this do it is- again. Well, all right. This is Commander Baylock of the flagship Farxarius of the First Federation. Years one through four, along with Trouble with Tribbles and Spock's Brain, means you have six albums to download. Go to fiveyearmission.net, download their albums, and have a Merry Christmas. Bill. This is what happens when I miss important staff meetings. (laughs) <laughs> yes, fiveyearmission.net. That is, I'm going to go on record, buddy, since it's it's the Christmas season. I'm going to say that is your best Farkism ever. <laughs> well, thank you. I got to tell you, I had one already written for today, but 10 minutes before we decided to sit down and record, I changed it. <laughs> We've done this, what, 150 times with the Farkisms, maybe. Uh, I, I don't, you've probably got a database of all of these. And, uh, out of all the ones you've done, that's been the only one I've genuinely laughed at. <laughs> well, th- well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad you took that as a compliment, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> FiveYearMission.net. Please make it a Merry Christmas and download all their music. We, we're begging you, begging you. Uh, Dan, uh, of course, we're going to be back in a, in a, in a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to take a little time off for the holidays, spend it with our families, um, you know, the Christmas season and of course the new year. And when we come back, um, we're going to probably talk about the biggest deep space nine episode of them all. Absolutely. As the 25th anniversary year or 25th anniversary celebration of Deep Space Nine year comes to a close in just a few days, we're going to let this celebration bleed into 2019 just a little bit because there's one episode that we have not talked about yet. And that, of course, is the finale of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So when we return from our holiday break, we're going to deep dive into what you leave behind. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be sad. And uh, I can't wait to talk about this one. It's one that's been building for for a long time, man. I agree with you. You know, so we, we had some schedule juggling in the last part of this year with uh, interviews and surprise guests and illness. And um, instead of trying to jam a couple of episodes into a holiday week, we decided, you know what? Let's uh, let's let's be with our families at the holidays, and we'll we'll do what you leave behind is the first episode of, of twenty nineteen. So that will be the case in a, in a few weeks. We will be back and ready to go because the uh, it's hard to believe the fourth anniversary of Trek Geeks is coming up soon. It's unbelievable, and it's been a great uh, three plus years coming up on the start of this fourth year. Can't think of anybody else I would rather do it with. I wish you a happy holiday. And a very happy new year, my friend. And I'm looking forward uh, to the future. 
That's amazing. As you're saying that, I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if I still have Andy Robinson's phone number. Wow. I knew. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Merry, <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, buddy, and, uh, <laughs> and, and to the whole fam. And um, uh, here's, to, here's to an even better 2019 because the past year has been pretty good to us. Absolutely. For more great Star Trek discussion, we want everyone to check out the Tricorder Transmissions online at the thetricordertransmissions.com. Dan, as we record this right now, I am wearing my Santa Gorn pin. Oh, yes, you pin, are. The <laughs> pin inspired by our good friend Jeff Hewlett, founder, co-founder of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. And uh, so I've got my little Fansets holiday pin on right now. It's, uh, it's very exciting, but uh, they have some great content over there. We want everyone to check them out. And then, of course, for all the news on all the Star Trek show, please visit our great friends at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode 163 of the Trek News Podcast. Happy holidays. Live long and prosper. Fa la 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 coconut. I got nothing. You look marvelous with that pin, I gotta say. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They are writing one song for each episode of the original series. Download their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks, a Star Trek podcast, is a production of Coconut Media Works, executive producer Bill Smith. For even more Star Trek discussion, check out Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and discoveringtrek.com. And if you guys want to start your audacity, if you're ready in three, two, one, go. Recording. Recording. That's fantastical. You guys are beautiful. Recording. I'm only Bing bong. S- I'm only semi pro. Yeah. <laughs> you're a total pro, Lau. Total pro. <laughs> and here you are for an outtake, too. That's even better. I wow. just want to throw that out there. Oh, I forgot. I got to worry about what I'm saying. I haven't even started talking yet, and already you're you're you know overshadowing me. So congratulations. The best part is you haven't started talking yet. Let's be honest. <laughs> How are you guys? Doing good. I'm I'm great. I mean, we've got the lovely and talented Norman Lau here. So I mean, we should uh, we should talk about him. So he looks fantastic too. You look fantastic. And Bill, take a screenshot of this right now so that oh. we can put that out there. Done. All right. <laughs> that was my really lame, like, Vulcan eyebrow. <laughs> I guess I'm not playing enough softball or whatever they were doing. Uh, take, me, take me out to the softball suite. I, I was going to say it was just, uh, it was your blue steel. <laughs> there you go. There you go. A little Thank Zoolander you. reference there. I am wearing blue. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so Bill, I have a, a Disney Trek geek story to share on, on today's outtake, which was quite cool. You mean like right now? Sure. Why not? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So so we're at Disney this weekend. Fantastic weather. Fantastic time. And I believe we were at Hollywood Studios, and we were walking towards the area where we would get on the tram to go to the entrance. And it's all completely under construction, so it's all different than what it normally is. The, the tram drop-off point is in a completely different place and this, that, and the other thing. So we're walking towards the thing, and a tram is going by, and I'm just watching – and there's a guy on the end of one of the trams, and he's going by. He looks at me, and he looks at my T-shirt. And as he's going by, he goes, hey, Trek Geeks, and keeps going. <laughs> and I'm like, no. So, yeah, so we may have had a, a listener at Disney at the same time I was there, which was which was kind of cool. I'm not going to lie. That's, uh, that's so random. It is. It is that, random. That's awesome. Or e- either that or he was just practicing reading for that day. <laughs> Thank you, Norm, for – for completely bursting right. my bubble. <laughs> I, I think your bubble burst a long time ago. Yeah, much like much like Julian needed Miles, you know, to mm. get out of someone's head. You guys yes. need to get out of someone else's head, I guess. Maybe Dan's. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Being in Dan's head is a bit like being in Sloan's head. Here we yeah. go. Lots um, of information in there. Uh, lots of papers just strewn all about, and most of them are from coloring books. Yes. Or parties. cows. <laughs> <laughs> Random thoughts just yeah. they just pop out. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Okay, so, uh, so Norm, mm-hmm. I, it's it's been a long time since you've been here on the uh, on the the Trek Geeks podcast. I didn't think of the name of my own show there for a second. I don't do well with these things. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were last on for episode one hundred. 
um, a long time ago. And I think this is what, 162, Dan? 163? 166 something. Once It's not 169 or I know that. It's 163. It is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, and uh, you guys have gotten so like colossally, galactically awesome since well, I mean, I don't know about that. Well, yeah. I, I like to think we got colossally awesome because of you. Well, I'm not going to, you know, I'll take some credit. Mm-hmm. I'll, I won't take all the credit, but I'll take some credit, at least for the portions that I talked about. <laughs> you get more credit than Dan does. I'm just throwing out there. Absolutely. Yes. No, that was a lot of fun. That was, that was a big episode. I was, I was really honored for you guys to have me on. That was, that was a big deal. It still to date is one of our most downloaded episodes. And I, I heard from somebody just the other day who said that they're actually on their fifth listen of it. Whoa. And yeah, no. And I'm like, um, I've had some people tell me that it's, it's probably one of the best podcast episodes they've ever heard. And I'm like going, uh, thank you one, but two, do you listen to a lot of podcasts? <laughs> Cause th- this is not serial. <laughs> like, like these aren't different podcasts. These are just different episodes. I'm only listening to one podcast. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, however, my. however, I do. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to credit all of that to you guys and to Vic because, you know, Vic was on that show. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I was just um, I was mouth piecing. <laughs> <laughs> you, nice uh, you were a hired help is what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, um, we we talked to Vic again last week. He's doing the, uh, the these are the voyages audio book for the Mark Cushman. Really? Yes, and you may know two people who do voices on that audiobook. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you might hear us. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a hint here. I'm not quite getting. <laughs> it. <laughs> I think it's the goofy laugh that may have sold it for you. I was yeah. Captain Pike. I was Captain what? Pike. <laughs> what? Are these spoilers? Is this a spoiler alert for the fans? No, no, no. This is a, this is out in the in the wild. Uh, this, this information. So mm-hmm. it's a uh, sweet. Yeah. I got to uh, do Gary Lockwood and Dan got to do Jeff Hunter. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. It was very cool. Super. So it's very intimidating to do voice work for a guy who has done legendary voice work projects. <laughs> <laughs> Did, okay. So I, I know this is your guys' show, but I got to ask you a question. Like, a pop- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there one particular thing that you learned about voice recording that you didn't know before from Vic specifically? Um. It's hard. That's you know, what she, I'm sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't. No, it's it, it, <laughs> it, it seems like it would be deceptively simple. I mean, you show up, you, you do a voice, you read the lines. No, I mean, there's things you have to take into account, like, you know, whether this is part of a conversation or, you know, whether or not this is just sort of an off the off hand comment or you want to be sure you don't read things too fast mm. or you don't want to do it too slow. I mean, there's a lot of variables. It's it, it's really kind of amazing. You know, you're sitting there recording and, and seeing yourself. Am I am I doing this right? Is he going to hate this? And uh, it's 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 stressful. Uh, do you, don't you think so, Dan? Well, I'm I'm going to pat you on the back, Bill, um, because from my understanding, you only had to do one take, and Vic said yours was fantastic. Me, on the other hand, it's amazing. The simplest of sentences can be interpreted differently by different people. Every single one of them can be different. So as I would read something. I, I would ask Vic for feedback on how it sounded. And he goes, well, try to inflect here and try to inflect here. So it's different ways of the actual dialogue. And of course, he's a master. So I did exactly what he wanted. But I got to admit, uh, I got to agree with Bill. It's intimidating. But at the same time, it was an incredible experience. And I think I did five takes. <laughs> Still, though, I mean, you were amongst friends. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was there. I mean, did, so how many times did you have to actually say sabotage? <laughs> Trong, you say Quilly. sabotage. I say sabotage. 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 <laughs> I gotta say, your your Kirk is pretty good, Norm. I'm not gonna lie. Dance is not bad, but you uh, you're right up there, my friend. Yes. Well, I have to put it under dress for several years. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. So we work with a guy who <laughs> just occasionally will throw random lines at Dan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and every now and then he'll just walk by and Dan will just respond in with the next line in the same scene. And he just is like, that's just amazing. (laughs) And if he, if he doesn't get the line right, he knows it. (laughs) He hears it from Dan. Oh yeah. You know, like what do you practice um, to hone your skills with a, with a impression of any kind is to do other like movies that you know really well, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, the Nazis wore gray, you wore blue. (laughs) (laughs) 
uh, <laughs> doing Casablanca in Rick's, you know. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. Dan like likes that. to do uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger just saying random things. Which yeah, I tell great. you, it's great. You love to be on the podcast tonight. It's going to be great. And we're going to go backstage. We're going to pump some iron. It's going to be great. Build such a jerk face. We got to get out of here. Yeah. So, get the hell out of here. Everybody <laughs> down. It's not a tumor. <laughs> Sorry. Correct your enemy. See them driven before you. Hear the lamentation of... <laughs> 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 I'm dying over here. All right, are you clowns ready to do this? Yeah, Dylan, you son of a bitch. <laughs> That's right. As a matter of fact, too many pencils. <laughs> <laughs> Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. <laughs> I promise I will not kill anyone. Get get to the chopper. Get to the chopper. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh right. God. All right, pre-roll whenever you're ready, Dan. Okay. Coconut!